Okay, this video is about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also called chronic obstructive lung disease, or chronic airway limitation. So COPD is actually two different conditions. They're both considered COPD, but they're characterized differently. So what characterizes the first one, emphysema, is actually a structural problem of the alveoli being hyperinflated, of the tissues being damaged. Whereas the chronic bronchitis patient is characterized by their symptoms of cough, excess mucus production. So let's look at this emphysema patient, also called the pink puffer. So what does the pink puffer present like? So because they have air trapping, because they're able to get air in, but their alveoli being stretched out and then the terminal bronchiole is kind of collapsing, they're not able to exhale CO2 normally. So they're CO2 retainers. They are in a chronic respiratory acidosis because of that. And we'll look at ABGs in a minute. So because they've got this air trapping, they have this increased work of breathing. They have air hunger. So this air hunger is creating an increased metabolic rate. So they're thin. This air hunger is going to eventually cause use of their accessory muscles in order to move air. So that's the sternocleidomastoid muscles, the external inter intercostal muscles are eventually gonna hypertrophy and that's what creates that barrel chest in these patients. Um, they also are characterized by trying to exhale their CO2 by doing what's called that purslip breathing. We're gonna talk about that again when we do interventions but this allows them to kind of have a prolonged expiratory time to try to get rid of that CO2. Because their alveoli are kind of stretched out and hyperinflated, their diaphragm is flattened out. Now normally the diaphragm does 70% of the work of breathing. Now being flattened out does not help their work of breathing at all. So it's just one more factor contributing to that increased work of breathing and that accessory muscle use. Okay, so and again, this is the pink puffer. So let's take a look at the chronic bronchitis patient, also called the blue bloater. So what characterizes this blue bloater? Well, chronic bronchitis is, by definition, is inflammation of the bronchioles. So this is about a patient who's got inflammation. So what characterizes inflammation of an airway? And that's excess mucus production. So excess mucus production and cough are symptomatology of this patient. So because there is mucus in the larger and the smaller airways, they have trouble actually getting air in. So they also trap air because their alveoli become hyperinflated over time, but they start out by having airway limitation getting air in. So excess mucus production not able to get air in is gonna create a situation where they're chronically hypoxemic. They're chronically deficient in circulating oxygen to their tissues. So this is going to support why they take on that blue bloater appearance. Well, first and foremost being blue. So what is cyanosis? We know it's a bluish appearance. Well, when you're hypoxemic, that means that more than two or three or four grams per deciliter of your hemoglobin is gonna be desaturated or deficient in oxygen. So that's all cyanosis means. Now, this patient has more than sufficient oxygen carrying capacity because they are polycythemic. They're taking on a bloater appearance. They've got this blue kind of ruddy appearance because they have more than normal hemoglobin levels because the kidney doesn't discern the difference between hypoxemia 
and a diminished um, oxygen carrying capacity or a diminished hemoglobin level. So the kidney is going to secrete that hormone in order to increase circulating hemoglobin levels because all it knows is that this patient is hypoxemic. So that's what creates a polycythemic patient. So their hemoglobin levels are in excess of 18, 19, 20 grams per deciliter. So again, very robust, ruddy, red, blue appearance to them. Let's talk about why they're bloated even more. Because the patient is hypoxemic, the pulmonary capillary bed doesn't discern the difference between hypoxemia systemically, not having enough um, circulating oxygen in the whole system, and having a deficiency in consolidated areas. See, this vasoconstriction of the pulmonary capillary bed in um, environments that are deficient in oxygen is supposed to be compensatory. It's supposed to shunt blood around the uh, hypoxemic areas in order to perfuse areas of the pulmonary capillary bed that don't have a consolidate, that do not have pneumonia. It doesn't know that the whole, that there is no consolidate. It doesn't know that it, the patient doesn't have pneumonia. So therefore, the entire pulmonary capillary bed is vasoconstricted. Well, a vasoconstricted pulmonary capillary bed is going to increase the resistance that the right heart needs to pump against. It's going to increase what's called that pulmonary vascular resistance. So an increased pulmonary vascular resistance over time is going to create a right heart that is working too hard and eventually going to create right heart failure. So what happens, what's the sequelae when there's right heart failure? Edema, generalized edema, jugular vein distension. Now we see another reason why this patient is going to take on this blue bloater appearance. So they're going to have all kinds of, you know, organ engorgement and edema. They're going to be cyanotic because they have a deficiency in oxygen. They're going to have um, hemoglobin levels that are higher than normal. And eventually when the right heart fails, the left heart is going to at first try to compensate. Eventually the left heart fails. So you have somebody with peripheral edema and general organ edema. And also when it's the left side, you're going to take on signs of left heart failure, which is crackles and you know pulmonary edema. So because it's the right heart that is you know having this increased resistance and the right heart being hypertrophied, well the sinoatrial node is located right above the right atrium. So because the heart is now going to you know remodel and it's going to be hypertrophied, it's going to eventually have uh, dysrhythmias of the right heart, atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation is very common in the COPD, you know, blue bloater patient. Let's talk about um, the blood gas of this patient. So we know they're hypoxemic and we know that they're hypercapnic or have an elevated CO2 level. So this patient walks around, if all is good, in a compensated respiratory acidosis with hypoxemia, with a diminished PaO2 level. So because they're chronically hypercapnic, they don't have the drive to breathe like you and I have. Our drive to breathe is a marginally elevated CO2 level and because of chemoreceptors, we know to take a breath in. While these patients have a blunted um, hypercapnic drive to breathe, and so their drive to breathe is actually hypoxemia. So you want to make sure that these patients in this end stage COPD have a PaO2 which sits right at 60. 
because if you give them too much oxygen, their drive to breathe is going to be now blunted. So we don't even want in this compensated respiratory acidosis patient, we don't even want their O2 above 60. However, because they are at such high risk for respiratory um, organisms, for respiratory failure, for pneumonias to hit them, they have decreased you know, cilia to help out, they have trapping of organisms and bacteria because of the increased mucus production. They get respiratory infections like that, and because of that, they decompensate fast and their oxygen goes down fast. So when your patient, or this patient, gets admitted into the ED with exacerbation of COPD, you better give them oxygen. They need oxygen to be 60, because when they're coming in at 40, you can't worry about their drive to breathe, because they need to be at 60 in order to have cellular respiration. Right. Our oxygen delivery device to use for these patients is what's called the Venturi mask. A Venturi mask allows for the precise amount of oxygen to be delivered just for that reason. Because we want to make sure, you know, an O2 sat is at 90% and not at 100% like other patients. Bye.